How old am I? I've been around. It sounds like a, it sounds like a lifetime achievement. But you're not that old. You've no, just I know. done a lot. I and have then, done it. I continue to yeah, do it. In two or three Somebody decades. actually interviewed me recently. I think it was a Canadian press thing. It said, um, so uh, are you slowing down a bit? <laughs> yes. I said, first of all, never, ever ask that question. <laughs> Right, ever. Right, right, it's like right. you don't ask that to a right, person right. ever. Are you slowing down? Are you slowing down? I said, yeah. never been busier in a passive aggressive way. <laughs> never <laughs> right. been busier. Uh, to which they responded, well, good for you. Yeah, at your like, age. How do you yeah. do it? <laughs> yeah. how, I mean, how do you feel, though, about Titanic in 3D and going through another set of interviews about that film? Let me just say this I am astonished by the Titanic obsession. You know, I mean, James Cameron is one person obsessed, but the, the fact that millions and millions and millions of people keep talking about it, seeing it, wanting to see it again, is still so, astonished. Still, yes, yeah, still astonished. It's the biggest film of all time. Yes, or because it was 15 years ago, and and um, as as proud as I am to be have been a part of it, and uh, believe me, I am. Uh, I I just I just find it you know amazing, and and I, when I was a kid. I, I saw, I think, A Night to Remember was the first Titanic movie I saw. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get over that story. And it was so, it touches people so deeply. Yes. Because it's such a, a real tragedy and from another time. And, and, and when you were making that film 15 years ago, do you, did you have any sense? I mean, obviously you knew this was going to be a, a big film, but did you have a sense that it would be the kind of thing we'd be talking about Never. 15 years later? No. No, I don't think anyone did. Maybe James certainly had a vision right. but uh uh no we as the actors uh, uh, you know we used to joke that it was water world too because because you know water world came out and right. it was like mm, could be us because you know there the we kevin were, costner mm, exactly. uh, epic that and that was did slightly you know, less well than, did not yeah, do well yeah. Yeah. so so really you know it was an extraordinary thing the whole the whole titanic you know i was one of the last people to be cast i was uh, i was i did a, a, a tape uh, in met with the casting director mally finn uh, it was sent to James Cameron. He got the wrong tape. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. This isn't the right guy. She said, really? And then she got back to her office like on the Monday and said, oh, they sent the wrong tape. I mean, it was one of those comedy of errors. And so I literally was finishing uh, playing Macbeth in San Diego right. at the Old Globe Theater and on a Saturday night and on Monday morning got into a van, drove down to Rosarita, Mexico, which was like, you know, miles just below the, the, the border, and uh, there, and then I met James Cameron for the first time, right. and the movie was being shot already. So I was like the last principal person to be cast. I should clarify for the people who have not seen Titanic. I think there are seven people listening who haven't mm -hmm. seen Titanic. So well, the no, they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I mean, you had been acting for a couple of decades when you were cast as the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews. So he awaits what he knows is the inevitable sinking with this admirable calm. Did you audition for that role or did you audition for a gig and you were cast in that role? No, no. I literally went to her, Mally Finn's office and read every scene on tape with what I thought was a bad Irish accent. Mm. Uh, and... But I did relate to the role. I mean, I knew when I read the script that I something in me was like, "Oh, I could do this." You know, and that's how I usually know that if a part is right for me, right. I can say it's all kind of inst instinctual. And so I felt completely connected to the character and, and admired the, this person enormously. And it was a small part, but it was a significant part. Well, it was a small part, but Victor, uh, I mean, even though you were in a supporting role, this this performance was often singled out, right? As in reviews, as one of the most notable. I, I think it was in uh, the New Yorker or New York Magazine that actually singled you out of the of the film. Uh, tell me about the impact that that role, that performance, and the response it got had on your career. You know, it's it's always hard to really know what some you know in the old days. You know, if, it, if especially a star making role, you'd say, well, you know, you know, Barbra Streisand in Funny Girl, and then everything changed. Mm. For me, it was like uh, it was like really what I felt like was I was finally on another list. You know, I was just on another list of actors because I had done mostly stage. You know, and I had played Liberace on a CBS movie, and that kind of. I was literally didn't work for two years hmm. in, in television because it was, I guess, a little too uh, believable, and hmm. everyone thought that's who I was. Hmm. So it took me a long time to sort of make my way back into film, and Titanic did that. I mean, it, and and people, you know, people were very moved by that 
performance. And mm-hmm. I think I, I was just lucky I, I played a great part. It, that part was the audience's eyes. That, that's the, the audience related to that character because, first of all, he was a real person. Yes. And secondly, they, uh, he, was, he was like the conscience of the... Of the sh- and, and I think the closest to James Cameron. That's who James Cameron reminded me of on the set. He was like th- that. He had that kind of uh, intensity. Mm. So, it, really, I, I think uh, you can't tell. It's like as a, I mean, I just, I just, I just keep going. I put one foot in front of the other and hope that someone will hire me. And I think it, it does. Uh, but in in the old day, that was a different time when 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 there were roles that changed people's careers. That didn't. It just put me on another list. Titanic is not your funny girl. <laughs> no. By the way, I'm thinking of reviving Funny Girl. <laughs> Or, right, you know, you've done the possibly, Marachi, yeah. you know, yeah, why not? Uh, and, and, and by the way, have you seen the 3D version? Okay, Jean, I have not seen You have it. not? No, How I'll do you feel you. about the, the, the fact that you will be in 3D? I, I think it would be too much for me <laughs> to see, but I'm glad that people seem to respond to it. And, you know, I see myself every day. I don't need to see myself right. uh, do that. Yeah, okay. but, um, but, I, but honestly, there is a part of me, and I will get it. I will get the DVD when it comes out on the 10th of September because we have a, a in, in our part in our house in the country the screen comes down and we can actually watch something on 3D so I think I would watch it in the privacy of my own home mm. so I wouldn't right. I could stop it and screening go to the of that little indie flick the Titanic and pour a drink yeah uh, I, I do want to get into more of what you're up to these days because there's quite a bit um, I, I don't know how you do it at your age thank this, you uh, Jill, this, thank uh, you I'm so glad I came <laughs> <laughs> uh, including this film premiering at TIFF but uh, let's, let's step back to the beginning of your career it's an interesting story you began as a as a stage actor uh, at the age of 10 at the, the We're going grand, that far back the grand theater it was in, a, in the 20s <laughs> yeah it wasn't it wasn't no, that far back, back. Okay, I, yeah. is is theater your first love yes theater is my first love that's how i started um, and then music took over for a while i was in the sugar shop as you so sweetly pointed out and uh, not so on I, the air yet i have it i'm excited oh, yeah, about well in a moment oh, you, yeah. well, we did we didn't talk about that earlier yeah, just yeah. before we had i was in the sugar shop that kind of took over my life for many years uh, and the canadian rock theater which was also a group i was in and then I, and then, but acting, yes, acting, when I finally really settled into acting, that's in the theater, that's kind of what I always wanted to do. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then movies came later. And you, you've said that with film and television, I'm quoting you now, Uh-oh. I'll do projects for money, I'm a whore. Really? I admit it. But with theater, I'm very picky. Yes, that's true. What does that mean? Well, first of all, theater is harder. To, 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 to invest in something, uh, to do a play eight times a week, every night in front of an audience, the play has to resonate deeply for me in order for me to commit to something like that. For uh, Usually it's a d- minimum three months, usually six, or a year, six months or a year. So if it's particularly a Broadway run, I, I, have, to, I have to really know that I won't lose my mind you know, and if you do material or if I do something that I don't believe in, on film, it's over, you know, or even television, you mm. know, because it only lasts off, it doesn't usually last very long. But for a theater piece, if, if it, say, is a hit, you've got to do it every night and you've got to find a way to make it special. And because I am take it very seriously, you know, I don't, I, I can't not give it all, my all. So, so for a play or a, a theater piece, it has to be something I Do you think you have to be a better actor in theater? Um, I think you have to be a certain kind of actor. I won't say a better actor because, you know, you're either good or you're not. You know, if, if you're not good, I mean, you, yes, you can be good on film and not good on stage. That's for sure. But uh, I, I only knew. Can you be good film. on stage and not good in film? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they're absolutely. different mediums. Yes, I mean, I think I think all acting comes from a place of, of truth, and I so I when people say what's the difference, I always say I don't really see the difference. I think you just have to be able to uh, tell the story of this person as honestly and as a, with as much of yourself uh, invested as you can, um, and that goes for stage or film. How can you stretch your craft in theater, you know, in ways that you don't? when you're shooting a film or a TV series? Well, in my case, I've had much greater roles on stage than I've ever had, ever had on film. You know, I mean, I've played Macbeth. You know, I've played, uh, I did Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. I did uh, um, Art, you know, Yasmina Reyes' play on Art. I've never, 
in ever on television or film had a role that that allowed me and that honestly that's the only sort of dream I have still and I, when people say what do you want to do what do you want to play I don't really have a role in mind but there is a part of me that wants the opportunity to do that on film okay and let me let me come back to that that's interesting and I, if you I, can help me out I'd appreciate it <laughs> after this interview everything yeah, will make, make some calls yeah. I, I uh, let me ask you about this. A few years ago, you were sticking with theatre to a certain extent. You were honoured uh, for your theatre work and for your TV work at the Banff World Television Festival. Uh, Peter Vamos, the executive director of the festival at the time, said you personify Canada because you're resource-rich and internationally respected. Wow, I should write that down because I don't remember that. <laughs> what do you think of that analogy? Do you feel you personify Canada? Uh, I don't know really what that means, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, first of all, it's very complimentary and nice, but I don't... Here's the thing. I, I'm very proud to be a Canadian. Mm -hmm. I've always loved Canada. I love working in Canada. I live in New York. I've lived longer in the States than I have in Canada. You've lived in New York for most of your career. Yeah, pretty much, and in Los Angeles. Do you still self-identify self as a Canadian actor? Yes, I do, but actually, I, do, I don't really self-identify as a Canadian actor. I just... I just I'm reminded of it, and... You know, there's the whole Godspell group, you know, Marty Short and, and Andrea Mart. Well, she's not Canadian, but but Eugene Levy, you know, where we 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 do feel like we are from a from we are from Canada. Mm. So we do identify. But to me, I never really understood what the difference was. Uh, I just happened to be Canadian, but I, I could just as easily have been British. I feel as much akin to the British as, as I do to American actors or mm. Canadian actors. I've always felt international and that I I have always thought I should be able to work anywhere as an actor. And so the, the border thing... Do people think you're American in the States? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, usually usually if it's a press thing, they say, oh, born in Canada or born in London, Ontario. Right. Uh, I talk about it because I'm proud of it, but I don't identify as a Canadian actor. I don't know what that means. There's a, there's an interesting um, moment happening. Well, it's been happening for the last few years, but in and around London, Ontario, that area of the world, of Canada, has spawned not just you, but I'm thinking of Paul Haggis, I'm thinking of Rachel McAdams, I'm thinking of Ryan Gosling, I'm thinking yeah. of Justin Bieber yeah. right, from Stratford. Right. Uh, any theories on on why this creative energy has come? Coincidence, yeah? I think. Really? What what could it be? You know, water? Know. The water? Well, the forest city? It's, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Better? The <laughs> air is better? I don't think so. I don't... You know what? That, that, could I be Stratford. Could be Stratford. Although, Clo you, you were never, inspired by going to plays at Stratford when you were inspired. a kid, yes, right? Yes, yes. But I think you know. Yes, I was actually. That's true. Um, and I don't know if Ryan, you know, ever went mm. there or, or Rachel, but they, you know, I think, uh, you know, Kate Nelligan, by the way, is from London, Ontario. Um, there, there, there have been some g really good actors, but uh, you know, Marty is from Hamilton, so fig go figure. And Eugene. You mentioned Godspell and Marty and, and, and Eugene. This so your first big role was as Jesus. Yeah, uh, that was yeah, one of the first things. The lead in this in the Toronto run. This is this iconic uh, edition of, of Godspell that you did back in, in 72, 73. Uh, this is the and that was a real afro. You actually had How dare you? Yes, of course it was. <laughs> I look at pictures that I well, think I that know, must I be think. a wig. Well, that I, was really I, your hair. I look at it and say, What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but Who this did I think I was? This role led you to New York, the, your Broadway career. I, you, you know, I can't tell you the number. We've had Paul Schaefer here. So many people talking about this God's spell. I wish I'd, I'd been able to see it. I wish I was you there. Were born. The I, I was born, but I was a little Baby. too young to understand right. what was going on. Did, did you feel like God's spell was going to be your big break at the time? Well, you know, all I can tell you about God's spell is that I was surrounded by some of the funniest, most entertaining uh, wonderful people uh, I've ever and still am close to. Mm. Uh, then when I was cast in the movie, uh, after opening night, the director of the movie, David Green, was in the audience, and we were the last... He'd seen all the... There were, like, I think, nine productions of Godspell in different cities all over the country, and Toronto was the last one. And I read in the in the paper, the Toronto Star, that, you know, that I was be I didn't even know that I was cast. And then suddenly said, and they're, they're Victor Garber is uh, going to... Con being considered for the role of Jesus in the movie, and then the next thing I knew, I was playing it, and then I left the Toronto company, and I was living in New York making this movie, and it was a very odd juxtaposition for me, and obviously, but 
ironically, that movie was not that successful and didn't really not much for my career. I mean, because I, well, <clears throat> starting with the hair. <laughs> because I looked odd and, and right. you know, I had a kind of an androgynous, you know, quality at 22. Not so much now. Um, uh, but, you know, then, the, so, so it kind of, I don't think it was, uh, it, it didn't really do much for me right. other than but I the got an stage agent. stage plays legendary now. Yes, because all those people, or most of those people, went on to become very successful. Gilda Radner, right. Martin Short, Andrea Martin. But it couldn't it. be a coincidence. There was something going on. You guys informed each other or something. You, 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 you got your chops together. Everything can't be a coincidence, surely. Well, do you, I don't know. What do you think it is, then? I think that... Divine uh, intervention? No, what? I think that, that there was something in... Well, I don't know, but I think maybe there was something <laughs> in that a, moment. We're on a slippery slope here. <laughs> no, obviously well, you guys you did here, something how that, about this? How that about, spawned... Uh, but by, by the way, you know, I went on to do the movie. You know, Marty went on to do What's a Nice Country Like You doing it you know, at the Dell Theater. I mean, nobody kind of like... Gilda was actually the only one who, who kind of mushroomed mm. into, you know, this... Enormous success. Right, you didn't all go from there to there, <laughs> there to make no. a success. Right? No, and then and then and it was just a group of talented people in the same room. But Victor, you had a fair bit of success as a folk artist, uh, right? You were well, playing. I, I played guitar and sang and wrote songs. Yes, and played and, gigs. And played about yes. When I was starting out, that's what I first did yeah. in Toronto when I was like. 18, 17. And would that have been the riverboat and stuff? Would that, would I that... played the penny farthing. The pe uh, the and penny then wash, the di wash dishes, literally, wash dishes in the kitchen right. to make a little money, then went out, played guitar, and sang, and actually sang with this girl, Judy Page, right. and passed the hat around. But this is the of... Gordy Lightfoot, Joni, yes, I remember, that whole era. Yeah, right? but I was never, ever, in, I mean, I were nowhere near that. But why wasn't music an op uh, an option instead of acting music was for many years i think what happened was that the music business was so well, the sugar shop we recorded it for capital records and then we made it a, uh, a single for epic records of, of laura nero save the country which was a beautiful actually another r r rendition of that song that that i thought was pretty impressive um i think i got t i got really burned out by the music business it was horribly hard mm. and then godspell happened unlike theater a walk in well, the park well by the way <laughs> less yeah. uh less i don't know i mean once you, you know once as an actor you had more control you could mm. say yes no you could audition get the part not get the part but a mu the music business now would be much worse even but but godspell once i became i mean even though it was a musical I, I I thought acting on stage was that's really what I was meant to do, and mm. so that's what I pursued. Can you can you identify what it is when you say acting is what you are meant to do? What what what, what the feeling is on stage? Um, all well, y yes. I mean, I kind of that's how I, I live my life by what how things feel. Mm. If 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 I'm in a room and you know it's like we all do instinct instinctively you know there's a person you actually feel like you want to talk to and and then there's another person you don't so there's nothing it's not a judgment it's just an, a feeling so you don't you know and and I if I read a script if I um, acting to me is a, is all about that is and it the audience as well the audience is definitely a player in that did you always want to be a a showman when you were a little I kid? was always uh, I always wanted to entertain. You did. Yeah. You always liked the crowd. Pathetic. Really. <laughs> Still do. Anything for a laugh. Because right. when I say I'm a whore, it, I'm, I, 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 uh, I'm a laugh whore. I love getting laughs. I love making people laugh. Yeah. And um, obviously in Godspell, that wasn't my role, but there sure right. were funny people. Right. And I loved, I loved that sound of laughter. And then you end up in in various films, TV shows, stage plays through the seventies, the eighties, nineties. It wasn't long after Titanic actually that Alias began. Uh, and just before we hit the air, I was telling you how I was uh, kind of obsessed with this series. I, I loved this show so much, and I loved your role. You played a double agent, uh, a kind of black ops spy, and and Jennifer Gardner's dad. She was also a spy, as I recall. Uh, you you've likened your time on Alias to your days in Godspell, the production uh, many years earlier. Why is that? What was the connection? Because uh, of the feeling of um, a family, uh, the camaraderie, the sense of, of belonging to something that was, that was meaningful. Uh, Godspell was the first, I'd say Alias was a part of that. Art, the play art that I did with Alan Alda and Alfred yes. Molina was another one. You know, that's, that's, I mean, I think as, a, as an actor, 
I mean, and by the way, I had, a, I had a great family, slightly dysfunctional, like all families. But um, I think that that you create the world that you want to live in. And and I was just lucky enough that Jennifer, Jennifer and I met. We just had this had this kind of weird connection, and uh, and remain close, very close. Yes. And, uh, um, and Godspell was the same. You you I read that you officiated her marriage to Ben Affleck after yes, learning how to do that on the internet. Well, I didn't learn how to do it on the internet. It was just uh, you, you, the, you, the only way you can get, you have to be, le- I thought, will this be legal? Right. I said to her when she said, will you do this? And she said, yes, you go on this website and you can be, um, you, you can officiate for one thing for one day. You know, so can I can you now? So, but you can no. marry other people. No. Well, I guess if I did it again, I think I don't even know. I think once you do it once, I think you know, they're <laughs> the, going to they're they're be lapses. knocking at your door. Yeah. Um, that character, Jack Bristow, was voted one of TV Guide's fifty greatest TV dads of all time. Really? Which, yeah, and your character was pretty ruthless, and and his relationship with his daughter, who played by Jennifer Gardner, was strained at times. Why do you think Jack was such a compelling dad? Well, I think because of J.J. Abrams is what I think. Because when I read that script, it's like what every actor looks for is is you know dimension and that character uh was was one of, one of the most complex characters created for television i think and i've read that in the script with the first when i first read the pilot thinking this is one of the best scripts i have mm-hmm. ever read uh and then i uh, was i was right by the way because because jj not, he there's nothing he's so brilliant mm-hmm. and and here's the thing about Alias, it's a family drama. Is really what it is. They just happen to be spies, right? And that's what I think. I think caught people because the relationship was so. He loved his daughter and was unable to show it, yeah. just like you know, like the great dramas, you know, yeah. Shakespearean. I mean, it had a kind of the mother was 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 absent and then suddenly makes an appearance in the third season or the second season, you know. Uh, and who who was this woman? So I thought we were, she was dead. You know, JJ's brain just is so facile, facile and so interesting, and I think that that's what Alias really was. And it just happened to be. And then, of course, set in the spy world, you could you had all that luxury to go. You know, all over your the place. brain is so interesting, and the way you seem to be able to be dropped into any situation in in television and carry it off not just with aplomb but with massive success you, you so you were in three Emmy nominations for alias but in addition you but you've been up for Emmys for your guest spots on Frasier on Will and Grace do you have a, a strategy for really nailing the guest spot on a show no not a strategy no God no no I I, I honestly Jean I, I look I look material is what intrigues me if if something well, let's put it this way. I mean, to be offered a role on Frasier was like a coveted thing, you know, mm-hmm. for an actor. And I didn't really even, I don't even think I knew read the script. I just said yes. Um, and it turned out to be a really good role. And Kelsey directed it, and it was a great experience. And then Will and Grace was just a kind of a fluke, really. Mm-hmm. I, I think Nathan Lane turned it down. I actually do, and he's a friend of mine. And I think he turned the role down, and I was in L.A., and I always thought the show was funny, and so I did it. I never expected an Emmy nomination, and frankly was quite shocked. By the way, never won an Emmy, just to, by the way. <laughs> a boatload of <clears throat> nominations. Yeah. Let me come back to this point, then, you made earlier in the interview. And you were saying um, you haven't had a massive role, the way you have in theater, right. a, a Jesus-like role, if we will, uh, in, in television. So... You've tended to be a supporting actor, um, both in film and TV roles. And, and in an interview, you, you once said, "I never had that one role that catapulted me. I just kind of marched along." You said, "You said you said you felt blessed to have never had that one catapulting role." Well, because what it allowed me to do was never, first of all, be typed. By the way, Jesus was the only role on. I should, you know, say the only role on film. It was my first movie. That was the starring role. That's the only starring role I've ever had in a film. And you argue if that was bigger, if that film had done bigger business, you would have been hampered by that. Through well, I think so. I think I think I was already. I think I was hampered by it. I think you know you see this kind of androgynous guy with uh, an afro singing, you know, "Oh God, I'm dying." You know, people. It's hard for people to kind of see you in any other way. Right. So if the movie had been more successful, you know, I think I would have had a harder time. Frankly, the 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 trick for me was that I was able to kind of 
come in under the wire, you know, in like, you know, Legally Blonde or, or in Titanic or in, you know, First Wives Club. They were, they were, they were significant but small, smaller roles. And so I got to, to kind of build a, a, some, a foundation of acting and, and was different, marginally different in each thing. Mm -hmm. So, and then Alias, Alias was a life changer, absolutely, because, because that was a weekly television show and I'd yes. never done that. Do you, does it, it, it sounds funny to ask somebody who's as massively successful as you are, but do you uh, lament the fact that you've not had a, a leading role in, in TV and film? Um, you know, I think, do I lament it? I, it certainly has crossed my mind. I think, what, am I doing something wrong? Am I doing, what, you know, or, you know, the worst thing you can ever do is compare yourself to anybody else. Mm. That's like, you know, just deadly. So, so, and sometimes I'll go to see a movie and think, well, gee, I, I could have done that part. Why, why wasn't I up for that right, part? Right, call you my right. agent, fire my agent, and fire my manager. And, uh, but, but I'm also, you know, a little, I'm smarter than that. And I also know that it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that, you know, I, I work, I, I earn a living, I'm successful, uh, and I continue to work. That really is more important to me than almost anything. But you want that leading. Role. I would. What, I would what, like what to would try it, it once. What would the role? Well, do you, do you... I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. That's the thing. I never know until it comes across the desk. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I did. I did a, a, a role uh, here for R Rishi Mehta, who is a wonderful director, and uh, it's a movie called "I'll Follow You Down." Sure. And I played Haley Joel Osment's father. Again, not a leading role, a supporting role, but it was a really wonderful role. And, and I loved doing the, and I thought, I want to do more. I, I have made a point of saying, okay, the role has to have a certain number of scenes. And if it doesn't, I say, sorry, can't do it. I'm not going to do any more cameos. I'm not going to do any more, you know, two scene roles in movies or television. You know, I, I say that cut to, you know. Steven Spielberg calls it. Um, <laughs> Whenever you like, Steve. Yes, I'll be there. Right, right, right. Um, you know, so, but, but. Waiter for 30 seconds, yeah, I'm no, in. I, I can I do can, it. I can do that. I can make something of it. And, um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's the, the sort of the a bit of a deal breaker for me. Because I, because I'm, frankly, I just don't want to invest the time. It takes a lot of energy and time to do a, a, even a small part in a movie. Well, then you got a bunch of stuff going on. So let me, quickly before I let you go. I mean, it was, it was interesting because we, we, we book. We want to do this career interview with Victor Garber, and it's it's almost hard when somebody's doing got as much going on as you do, or or is associated with as many things to pick what to talk about because you've got the Titanic 3D film coming up, but you also have this film um, premiering at TIFF, directed by um, uh, Ben Affleck, uh, called Argo. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that film and your role in it? This is one that's going to the. Cana some, most Canadians are going to remember this episode. Well, yeah, I, history, I, play, right? I play Ken Taylor, yes. you know, who is, uh, uh, you know, a hero in Canada and a remarkable man and uh, still with us and coming, hopefully, I hope hope to meet him one day. Uh, it was it was one of the best experiences I've ever had working on a film. It's, a not again, not a large role, but, you know, when I, as soon as I read that script, I said, yes, this is something I want to do because... It's the it's it's an ensemble piece that's one of the most captivating and and crazy stories uh, of that's based that's a true story. Right. Um, so uh, this is Ken Taylor and and the Canadians the, smuggling the Americans out six Americans six yeah. Americans who were who escaped the embassy during the crisis the, right. the takeover, and they were the only people that escaped. However, they couldn't get out of the country. So the 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 trick was what. How, where do they hide, and how do they get out of the country? Meanwhile, 444 days it took to get those Americans out. Yeah. And it was a harrowing time. And by the way, when you see the movie, it brings back some of those, that, that, that horror that was going on. I mean, these, they, they didn't know if they were going to be, we didn't know if they were going to be murdered, all of them, mm. you know, and it could have happened. Uh, and there were people murdered. Uh, that these six Americans were hidden at, with the help of the Canadian embassy. And did you seek uh, Ken Taylor's counsel on on who who and what he was at that time? I didn't because I I I I've always felt like it can be dangerous for me because it's a movie. It's not the it's not a real it's not the real thing. I read about him. I watched videos of him. I certainly knew his story. Mm. And I then had to incorporate that 
through me into the script as written because it was, you know, it's a movie. It's this, they didn't actually say those things. Right. And by the way, no one knows exactly what right, anybody says right, anyway. Right, right. So, but, but, the, the, but I, what, what is so impressive is the way Ben tells this story as a director. And I'm, I'm assuming, Ben Affleck, given your proximity to Jennifer Garner, he's a good friend of yours? He is a, he is a good friend. But we, and I had done a, a cameo role in the town, so we'd worked together on that, you know, and, uh, you know, that was sort of like a, a just a, he said, oh, just do this role. And I said, oh, okay. You know, let's and, uh, and by the way, I loved that movie. I thought that was an incredible movie. Mm -hmm. This, this was, uh, uh, this movie was, there, there was a character and a real part, and I really felt uh, honored to be a part of it. And, and also working with Ben as a director uh, in this movie, it, it, the dynamic was different, and, and I, I felt like we sort of established a different kind of relationship than we'd had. I was going to say, is it hard to be directed by a friend? No, it's actually it can be the best, and in this case, it was. He's so collaborative, so smart, and uh, only wants th only wants you to look good, mm -hmm. only wants you to be as good as you can be, and and w is open to anything you want to bring. And then, by the way, knows what he wants, and will say, you know, I, th I think we should try it without you saying anything here. It's he's m kind of masterful. Victor, there's there's all the things that you've done and there's all the things that you could do and then there's all the things that your audience, your fans want you to do. Um, I, I would include myself in those and I would say you grew up near Stratford. You went to the Stratford Festival and saw the plays when you were a kid. How come you haven't done Stratford? Uh, here's why. Um, because I moved to New York at a very early age and theater, that's where I started doing theater. Um, for me to uh, go to Stratford for an extended period, which it normally is, would be very disruptive to my life. Mm. Uh, so if I'm going to do a play, I don't want to go so far from home. Mm. And that's really a, a simple. I spoke to Anthony Cimolino, the new artistic director. Uh, Did you Stratford. pitch me for something? I I asked him. By the way, thank you. I, I I asked him why why you haven't done Stratford. He said, uh oh. He said he would love you to do Stratford, and he said, tell Victor this. I said, can I say this on the air? He said, yes. Wow. He said, tell Victor, I will do. We will do it for any amount of time he wants to. So if he wants to do a short stay show in Stratford, we can make that work. Well, that is very flattering. And by the way, I'm going to have my manager call him. No. Okay. I. You know what. <laughs> it, it could it could so happen, but even but here's the thing: a right. short what is a short period? I don't know. Three I can't months? do the negotiation. Well, I, well, but you better. He... You just get on the phone now. Just, but they I mean, want by, you. By the way, how much? No I'm kidding. <laughs>